It's really interesting to think about what DNA is because it contains the genetic information for all life on Earth. But the information is not in the letters themselves. It's in the sequence of letters. My interest in nanopores goes back to a lonely little drive up in Oregon. So I'm just driving along, you know, as we do, and dreaming about uh, stuff that scientists dream about. And then something happened up in my brain that made me pull off to the side of the road and start to make a sketch. That was the beginning for me of the interest in what we now call nanopores. Two years later, Dan Branton was visiting my campus and uh, we just chatting about a new way to, to make sequences of DNA. Could there be a simpler way? Dave uh, told me about his idea, which I thought was much better than any of my ideas. And uh, got so excited that uh, wanted to start work on it immediately. So it's like a threading a needle, uh, something everybody knows about. So imagine I've got a hole in a needle, okay? And I got a thread out here. Now that thread is just jiggling around. Suppose I have a voltage across that pore. Now the thread not only comes near the pore, it gets pulled through. By pulling the DNA through the interface, we know the sequence of subunits in the DNA. Somebody said, oh, that's cold fusion. That'll never work. Why did I think it was not going to work? Uh, it's because it, it, it's a very demanding thing. You have to be able to thread a single strand of DNA or RNA, nanoscopic uh, targets, through a tiny hole and drive it through that hole. I asked Dave Deemer, Dave, if you can show me that the DNA or, or RNA is actually going through the pore, then I'm convinced and I'd like to come and join you. And they uh, executed those experiments and published them in a, a journal in 1996. Well, it's interesting to think about the reactions of our colleagues. Nobody believed it. Most of the individuals who you would ask about nanopore sequencing would say that it has zero chance of succeeding at the time, and so we were uh, swimming upstream. So our publication uh, just kind of, you know, was interesting, you know, that's nice, but nobody really picked up on it. We had the field to ourselves for a 10-year period that nobody else I wanted to pick up on what we had discovered. So in 2007, two guys came into my office on campus and they were two people involved in a new startup company. They thought that maybe the nanopore sequencing idea would work. They said, we want to license your patents. If you can get a handshake between academic science that is exploring and discovering new things and industry that can bring those new things out into the marketplace. That was very important. Basic research comes first, supported by grants, and then the uh, discoveries are given to the public by industry. We have succeeded in sequencing with a nanopore device, and here it is. And here's this little thing the size of a cell phone. That caught people's attention. The impact of nanopore sequence has really been uh, quite profound. Uh, for example, tracking fungal disease outbreaks in critical care units, 
or even the Ebola virus infections in remote locations. Then somebody said, let's fly this on the International Space Station. Kind of overwhelming, actually, to see the technology go from taking an entire year to be able to read at any level a DNA or RNA strand to the point where you're reading thousands and thousands of these molecules, millions, and doing it on a tiny machine, a tiny sensor, was astonishing to us. This is like hanging on to the tail fin of a rocket going up into, into space. And that's what it felt like. This is now beyond anything that we could do, so it's been a deep pleasure deep satisfaction.